Hey guys, my name is Nick. I'm a Microsoft Certified Expert Administrator. I create a lot of content for MSPs. Today's video is part of a little mini series I've created here on securing the remote workforce. Today's going to focus on data loss prevention, but if you've been following along here, I've gone across the entire solution stack from Microsoft, done Azure AD, Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, and Intune up to this point. So if you haven't checked those out, I highly recommend that. But same format here, we're going through the best policies, procedures, recommendations to harden these environments that you guys are managing as the managed service provider. Again, today we're focusing on data loss prevention and going through some of the policies that you can set up to help harden that environment. Keep in mind the licensing that I'm speaking to in most of these is Microsoft 365 Business Premium. It's a great solution for the SMB market and cost effective at $20 a user a month. It does include a lot of the heightened security and compliance features which you traditionally only got with the enterprise plans. So just note that when we're going through the recommended controls, I'll point out whether or not it comes with more of the base level plans like Microsoft 365 standard uh, or something like that. So before we get into the recommended controls here, I just wanted to go through quickly uh, uh, in regards to the threat landscape when it comes to data loss. A lot of these bullet points here you can identify with in the sense of being a concern at the customer level, but I just want to lightly touch on each one here. So we obviously have accidental leakage of somebody sharing information with people they're not supposed to or sharing documentation of which they don't know contains certain pertinent information or sensitive information like credit card, PII, things like that. There's also accidental loss where we're actually sharing that or sending that out to people that we're not supposed to and there could be more of a publicity or uh, monetary loss because that information is now out in the wild or in the hands of somebody we don't need it to be in. Opportunistic theft is there as well too where somebody who can breach the company has the opportunity to access corporate documents that contain this sensitive data because they're just any user within the company now. They breached one user and now they have access to all the financial data, all the IP of the company, things like that. It's definitely something that you don't want to happen. There needs to be a layered approach to security. Targeted theft is another one here where you have a user that is looking for a certain document or they're trying to attack a certain user or they're phishing a certain user to try to gain certain access to certain information. So this is another way of which some people may be targeting data. Malicious insider could be somebody that is um, you know, recently fired or has been you know, taken into the native light for the company and they wanna cause malicious harm to the company. They have access to all these documents today that may be something that uh, they, they don't lose access to whenever they leave the company. There may be loopholes in which you haven't covered of which they've stored data or they're accessing data on a personal device. And lastly, here we have non-compliance. So we're looking at regulations like HIPAA, FINRA, NIST, things like that of which we have to comply to. Most specifically HIPAA when we're looking at transferring or sharing PII not only internally but externally as well to the methods of which we're doing so the ways we're accessing that data on personal devices things in that regard so getting into it here as far as the recommended controls i have a lighter list today just because these are heavier in the sense of the configuration and a lot of msps i know aren't really getting into a lot of these yet because they're so brand new especially to the business stack so i wanted to focus on these and give you guys some more time um, in, in going through all the settings because there'll be much more of a, um, a new setting for you to actually see. So the first thing here we can do is configure data loss prevention policies. Traditionally this was only combined with the E3 plans. It's been included now with Microsoft 365 Business Premium as well. And so with these policies you can configure them to protect certain sensitive information that is detected not only in Exchange, but also across SharePoint OneDrive as Teams as well too. You can then enforce certain controls like restricting people sending that to external domains, encrypting that data if it's sent externally, encrypting if it's sent internally, restricting who can actually access the documents that you're sending, things like that. So you can get really granular with these controls here, but I did want to show you within the portal the actual setup of these policies and things like that. So if I'm going into a uh, tenant here, I've already stood this up just to show you what this actually looks like from the end user perspective, but you would come down into the security and compliance center here. I'd like to go to the compliance center and then pop into the security, the legacy security and compliance center. 
go into data loss protection or prevention and go under policy. So I've already created these here again, but when you're going through and setting this up, you can click on create a policy and you'll notice here they have pre-built sensitive information types that you can grab. I recommend obviously looking at the customer's vertical to see where they're exposed or where they need additional security layered on top for compliance reasons, especially PII in the sense of looking at HIPAA customers, things like that, but also just general financial data as well too is a good one to set up. So you can pick the US financial data here and you can include already credit card number, US bank, ABA, all of that here, you can click on next, give it a friendly name. And here's where you can protect certain locations. So you may just wanna have certain requirements in Exchange Online, but you may not wanna have those across Teams, OneDrive and SharePoint, or you may wanna to isolate to Teams as well too in the sense of chat messages, things like that. So some common policies here, obviously when you're looking at financial data, you obviously maybe not want people to send credit card information out externally. You obviously have to evaluate the customer and what they're doing, but those are common ones, or maybe you don't want customers or internal users, I should say, sharing credit card information over Teams. This is a common one that a lot of MSPs are gonna to wanna to set up. You can set the basic settings here, and this, this is really basic. I like to use the advanced settings, click on next. You can then go under the low volume of content detected that's US financial. It's got a priority of zero, so it's gonna to try to detect this first. You can edit this rule, and here's where we get into all the granular controls. This is where you have you know, the instance count that is matching that here. And this is look, also looking for accuracy of it being a credit card number, a US bank account number, an ABA routing number. And so if it's under these, usually if it's just a one-off you know, you can do this. You can do this for social security numbers as well, too, which I'll show you the example of. And you can say if it's people with outside people outside my organization, then as an action, I want to restrict access or encrypt the content. And this is where you can just say I want to just apply encryption to the message or I want to say that everyone, um, you know, is going to be blocked from doing this or only people within my organization are going to be blocked, or people outside my organization are gonna be blocked from accessing these types of files. The cool part here is this this will actually trigger if it's if it's um, credit card number, US bank account number, ABA routing number, that is in a document completely. So it'll detect that. And it'll also detect if it's just typed out in the body of the email message as well too. So I like to set this up, block from sharing and restricting access to content. And then I like to say um, only people outside my organization inside will have access. And then down below here, you can choose whether to send uh, notifications about the sensitive information when it's blocked for some reason. I like to include that obviously to keep them um, in the loop on what's going on and why we're doing this. And I also like to give a custom policy tip something to say along the lines of, you're not allowed to share this information outside the organization. So it gives them some clear messaging on what they um, can do here. Additionally, you can allow for user overrides, so you at least have you know a justification that's audit, audited within the company that you can include, that you can reference at a later time. Just brings awareness to them as well too about, hey, maybe I shouldn't be sending this across uh, or outside the organization. But the big thing with this is also a good, you know, a good example would be um, if you block, you're blocking them sending out credit card information outside, but they're they're sending it to a legitimate customer whose credit card that is. That's a legitimate business reason and justification for for overriding that uh, policy that you're trying to set up there. So that's a good example of what that might look like. But obviously you need to talk to the customer, you know, about their day-to-day -day processes and what kind of information they're sharing both internally and externally to get a good idea of all the settings that you're gonna to wanna to do here. The cool part about these policies is after you're, you're done here, um, you know, you can test it out first, show policy tips in test mode. So you understand impact, but you don't have to turn it on right away. So you can do the audit trail and get a full understanding of how much it's going to impact users before just turning it on and getting a bunch of help desk tickets coming at you saying, hey, you're blocking all my emails to my customers. So be careful with this one. Again, I've uh, already set this up so you can see it in action here, both in Teams, I've set one up for just 
um, U.S. financial data within Teams and also in email as well too. So I'm gonna pop into a test tenant here and show you that. So I'll go into, this is a end user device here. I just called it DLP. And what I'm gonna do is go into email and I'm gonna send a new email out and I'm gonna say, this is an external user. I'm gonna say this is going to be a document where we have um, certain credit card information or social security numbers in, included. So let's just say test DLP. And then I'm going to insert a file here. I'm gonna actually pull one up from this PC. And I'm gonna use this expense records here. So before I send this, I'll just show you what's inside here. It's got credit card information, security codes, and expiration dates, including the names here. So it's definitely something that's a highly sensitive document that you want to be careful about sending outside. So I can go ahead and click on send here, and this will try to go send through, but most likely I'm going to get blocked because of the DLP policy I have in place. So got it here, just came through, and it takes about 10 seconds because it's scanning the document, but it's giving you this message here that said, you know, it's sent to people outside of your organization, contains sensitive information, credit card numbers here. So it's a good little message, and you know, you can then, that's where you could use those user overrides if you didn't want to block them completely from sending this. Additionally here, I've created another policy to block the social security numbers from going through as well too, so we'll test that one out as well. And this one, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not going to put it in a document, I'm just going to paste this in here and I'm going to go ahead and try to send it. So that one's coming through now and it's detecting this in this well and it's also saying that it's got that sensitive information in there. So that's a clear example of it, you know, just capturing that data and not allowing you to send to certain recipients in the organization or outside the organization. Uh, so that's a good one I would set up to block that information from going out. There's there's not a lot of use cases in which, um, you know, those things should be going out. And if they are, you might want to use that business justification to do so. So these should be going through encrypted channels at least and through the proper methods, not usually through an unencrypted email like you saw there. So these methods here, you know, it auto detects this information and it's a really cool part of the service as well from DLP. The same thing is true if you set up a policy here in Microsoft Teams. So a good one to do is to say, if it's going to an external user, it contains a sensitive information and block that. So this is me trying to send a you know MasterCard information here for a credit card number, and it was blocked from, from doing so here. If I try to paste that in again, I'm just gonna get that same message to come up. It takes about five seconds, but it won't fully send. <laughs> and you'll get this email notification if you set to do that it says it was blocked and it's because i'm i'm chatting with an external person here you could choose to say like hey i have a policy that you can't send this kind of information over teams because it's a very insecure channel which i kind of recommend because you shouldn't be sending credit card information or social security numbers or anything like that over these channels in my opinion over chat especially not in a Teams group with multiple people who can see that information. This then becomes harder and harder for you to keep track of all the places that it's at. So those are some of the cool policies there you can set up with uh, Teams as well that I wanted to show you. And additionally, you know, within the Microsoft 365 Admin Center here, if I go back to that tenant, You have the ability here to come in and review uh, certain policies that have matched. You can also see incidents that are tracked. There's about a 24 hour delay on this, so just keep that in mind. But if you click on uh, view the details table, you'll see if it's classifying certain information as a uh, high volume of content detected with certain PII in it. If you set up policies to detect this certain information, um, and you can define you know, what the severity is on that as well too. So you do have a complete audit trail of it picking these things up and it's got this coming across and, and viewing this as far as this being within you know, SharePoint or OneDrive as well too that you can see right off the bat.
So it's really cool to actually come in here and see this information as well too in a report. And if there's been any high consistencies of uh, policy being matched, then you want to look at that as well too. So the next thing I wanted to look at is the app protection policies. So the app protection policies are specifically from Intune. So this is the mobile application management side of Intune. And this does allow you to create policies that can allow users to access corporate applications or corporate, corporate data on personal cell phone devices without actually having to enroll that device in the MDM solution. So this is great for you to set up. It's very lightweight in the sense of the time it takes you as an admin to set up a policy and the kinds of protection that you're getting on both iOS and Android devices. So this specifically protects at the app level. So it can restrict cut, copy, paste, can restrict save as to unmanaged applications. And it does allow you to remotely wipe the data off of that device at any time. So within the um, admin center here again, you would go into the endpoint manager admin center. You would click on apps. You can click on all app protection policies here. I've already got these set up just as an example again, but you can create a policy here. We'll get into the windows information protection policies next. The functionality is really the same uh, in the sense of what we're, we're trying to accomplish here. And that is specifically to manage devices that aren't enrolled into an MDM solution. We can do the same with devices that are enrolled, but specifically, we obviously want to protect that information from being exposed and moved into places like personal Gmail or third-party SaaS applications that we're not managing. If you're using OneDrive and people are trying to save to their Box account or Dropbox account, for instance. So within these policies here, I'll just click on one to show you the properties and what we're doing here. Uh, you have the ability to add applications. So I typically may add the entire office suite here so that you can protect everything that's in these applications. You could add third party custom ones if you really wanted to as well too. But then you're going to go through and actually block the ability uh, to save back of the org data on the Android itself. You're gonna allow them to send the data to other policy managed apps, but that's it. You're gonna block them from saving copies of the org data to that local device as well. You can restrict cut, copy, paste between the managed applications. You can also block screen capture and Google Assistant so that they can actually take screenshots of the org data as well too on those devices. And you can actually encrypt the data so it's encrypted at rest as well on those devices too. Block printing of org data is another one that you can specifically set up. And here, this is a good reason why you can come down into the access requirements too. Additional security can be involved at the application level. So they are setting up a pin to access the resources of every 30 minutes. So of inactivity that is. So this gives you an additional layer of security so you can protect the application and corporate data on that device. And a good example of this actually is on an Android device, this is what you'd see if you're going to the native mail app and you're trying to connect to your corporate account it's going to redirect you to the google play store and have you download the outlook app so that you can then protect the data on that application you can remotely wipe that data at any time in case the employee leaves the company or uh, the device is lost or stolen for instance so it's really giving you a, a really great layer of protection for one policy that you're really setting up in the company there for personal cell phones things like that Additionally, you can do the same with Windows Information Protection. So this flows in line with my next one here. Windows Information Protection has a lot more features in the sense of integrating with AIP, which we'll get into next. But at the high level, you can do this you know, with enrollment, without enrollment, and it protects the applications on the device from moving them into unmanaged applications. So a good example I give, give of this is actually on this D2 device. Let me sign in real quick here. So back in here, I can go and let's say I'm in a Gmail account here. Let me pull this up. So I can start a new message here and I can try to attach one of my corporate documents to send via Gmail. You'll notice I have this icon set up as part of the WIP policy as well too so that you can actually see the difference of corporate owned applications within the, the account. 
and I can click on one of these documents that I'm trying to send via Gmail, click on open, and it tells me cannot use work content here. So it's protecting you from that level and also cut, copy, paste. So if I'm in here and if I go to another Teams message maybe, yep. I'll just copy this message here as an example. We'll go back into this email and we'll paste it in here and I get the same message. So again, restricting cut, copy, paste, restricting save as, restricting attaching it to third parties that we're not managing. So it gives you that high level protection for both enrolled and unenrolled devices, which is the key thing there, especially in today's remote workforce. So the next one here is configure AIP labels. So this one's highly underadopted in my opinion. Um, so this is something where you have the ability to apply a certain label as an identifier to your documents here and you can apply certain controls as part of that label. So this is traditionally, again, been part of Microsoft 365 Business Premium. It's also included with Azure Information Protection Plan 1 and it is $2 standalone per user per month. It includes the traditional RMS templates you guys might be familiar with where you can apply certain protections here. But within the Azure Information Protection Blade here, it's it's kind of more confusing. I'm gonna do a whole video on this to demystify it for everybody. But they've transitioned here from the classic labeling, which you traditionally did here in Microsoft Azure. And you just get here by going to portal.azure.com, going to all services and searching for Azure Information Protection. This would bring you to this blade where you can see the labels that have already been set up or if you've never enabled this before, it's a newer tenant, you can generate the default labels here which are, are listed as such. And I'll go over the, the taxonomy here in a minute as well too. So this allows you the ability, you know, you traditionally worked out of here, but they all, they've, they're trying to migrate things to make it more intuitive for everybody. So they've migrated the labels into the Security and Compliance Center, and this is going to be forward-looking, the location of which everything's at. So they've given you, you know, unified labeling in the sense of having these labels here. So I'm going to work out of this portal just because it's easier to identify with. When you think about Azure Information Protection, there's two plans you get, Plan 1, Plan 2. And there's some confusion around what that means. But the biggest thing I like to mention is Azure Information Protection Plan 2 is where you get automatic labeling based off of sensitive content, whereas with AIP 1, you do not. So it's a big difference there because it can detect certain information, just like the DLP feature does, where it's saying, hey, I found some credit card information. Let's block you from sending it externally if that's what the policy says. Additionally, you know, you can do the same with AIP Plan 2, um, but this is something where you would want that additional layer as far as Plan 2 um, to be in place in this additional fee. With Plan 1, you still got a lot of cool features, which I'm going to go through here. You have the pre-made labels here that people can use, and by default, they're not published with a policy, so they won't be able to see these anywhere at any time. But with these here, you can click on any one of these and you know you can see the general settings of which you know, is entailed with these. I like these ones out of the gate. I like to turn general into internal. To me, that's a little bit more intuitive. But the taxonomy, you're going to have to go over with your customers in the sense of you know what you want them to see here. You can see the description for the users here that you know you can use sensitive data. data and I'll show you what they see when they actually apply these, these labels here. So normally, you know, you apply encryption here. You can assign permissions now or let users decide. You can choose when the content actually inspires, expires with these labels. And you can choose to say you block on offline access and you give permissions here. So again, I'm going to do a full video deep dive on this because it's more complex. The basis of this is you want to start to organize the documents within the organization, not only for just straight organ organization, uh, but also for compliance reasons like GDPR, making you having to uh, require those labels to be in place for classification, but also just heightens the controls as well too. So confidential, highly confidential, 
being documents that you say you cannot send these outside the organization. And if they are sent within the organization, they're going to be encrypted. So just heightened security like that. Or you can add content marking as well too with watermarks, headers, footers, things like that to customize the actual content. And this is where I was getting into auto labeling, which which is with plan two, which I'm so I'm not going to get into it here, but it is part of the Azure Information Protection Plan holistically. With these, after you're done, you can go into the policy labels and actually create a label policy. With this, I have a global policy set up here for all my users, but obviously you can scope this out to whoever you really want to or scope different policies to different people. I like to keep it generic, honestly, at first, just to understand the organization. Usually with SMB, you can keep it at a high level of generic one. You can choose which labels to publish as part of this. This is what users will see. You can choose the scope it again, and you can choose what the policy settings are. So you can say there's always going to be a default label that's part of this group. You can choose to have them uh, provide justification to remove a label or a lower classification. I like this one because it's a high watermark, right? So if they if you choose highly confidential for a document, somebody tries to change it to public, they have to provide a justification. You have a documented process for that as well too. Uh, I don't like this one in the forefront of it because it's very interactive with the users and it's requiring them to place an email on their email or documents. And I, I don't like that. It gets too cumbersome when you start to do that. I like to give a lot of training around the taxonomy and give them recommendations, but making them and forcing them to do that other gate is not one of my recommendations. You could also create a link to a custom help page that identifies and describes, gives examples of the kinds of classification that you're going to be applying. And you can say, okay, you know, for, for public, this is what this means. Here's some examples of documents within your company that are public. So you can really customize this. You can give it a name and description if you really wanted to, and then push this out. But from the end user perspective, you know, there's a couple of, of uh, different considerations here. One of which is the AIP client. This is something of which you, know, you can download and push out as an executable across the board. And what this does here is it creates um, you know, this experience for them when they're actually creating a new email or having a new document created where they have the ability here to set the sensitivity. And when they do so, you know, you can, you can classify it here. It'll apply that label to the document. So if you apply a label like highly confidential to an email, you can say you can encrypt it. It'll send that message encrypted to the users that it's applied to. And additionally here, you can come and change it at any time. So I can say highly confidential and it's giving me the description that I've set here. And that's more intuitive to the end users, in my opinion, to be able to do that. And you can say, you know, whatever this is, we can just say label test and I'll just say test here and I'll send this message here. And I'll let it come in through on this side. It takes a minute because it's encrypted. And then if you're familiar with encryption in Officer 65, you're familiar with this and going into the OME portal to open that message. Additionally there in Word, let's say you don't have the Azure uh, Information Protection Unified Client pushed out to users here. Additionally, you can um, have that as part of the native experience now. This, this um, UI will be part of the Office suite of all future deployments here. So you'll, most users will see this. And if you publish labels, they'll be able to see this if they click on the dropdown. So they might not see the bar here, which comes with AIP client, uh, but this does allow you to still classify the documents you know, when you're going to do that and applies the label here so that you can detect that. The big thing here um, is making sure your users fully understand you know, what the labels are, come to agreement on the taxonomy, and then to roll this out slowly over time to send it to your champions within the company, then come back and reiterate if you get feedback about them not being very intuitive or maybe need, things need to change with the taxonomy. It's definitely like a slow rollout that you want to have 
with these labels over time so that you can start protecting those documents and apply these certain controls like the encryption again or blocking them from sending highly confidential documents to external users. You can get as granular to say you cannot print these documents at that level as well too. You can even get as granular as saying that you do not want them to print the documents as well too. So that's actually at the label level, depending on what you want to set there. So highly confidential, for instance, I could edit this label and I can go next. And here under assign permissions here, you can see that this is labeled as co-owner. If you assign permissions here, you can choose the groups that you're addressing here, and then you can choose the permissions. So you could you could block them from you know printing these documents. You could do custom completely here and really get granular as far as the controls that they can get. I don't personally get that far um, just because of the complexity that's involved, but you may have to use cases with clients that, that do get into that as well too. Well, those are all definitely possibilities here as part of the taxonomy. Lastly here, I wanted to cover the AIP scanner that's available too with AIP1. This is something where, that you can run on a DC or a network share um, in your SharePoint on-prem environment as well too that does a scan of all the documents in that share to give you an output and a visual of the kinds of content that are in there. So this is great if you're running a hybrid environment or you don't have all your documents in the cloud yet. You can run this, I'm gonna make a video on how you set this up and how you configure this. But basically you're deploying this as a node on you know wherever the file share is um, or something like that. And you can run a content scan job on that and I can see my repositories here. I'm just mapping the UNC path of the file share that I have. And it's or grabbing all the content on there and scanning all of it to see if it's I've applied any labels to these documents to see what kinds of information are in there. And from there, you can then look at these usage reports by connecting it to Log Analytics, which just requires an Azure subscription and I'll get into the pricing on that in another video. It's a per gigabyte model. But when you do data discovery, you can start to see the different various methods of which you have data, not only in the cloud, but also within the on-prem environment as well too. So it's a very powerful experience for you to come in here, see the information file types that are in as part of the, the uh, map drive here or the file share and then you can determine you know, what is in there completely. So you can click on that and you can see all these files and you can see what type of classification of information is listed within there. Obviously this is gonna be less for you. I just have it all over the place with a bunch of test data, but it's really good visual for you to come in and actually look at. You can use the information protection client to also get this information across endpoints as well too. Otherwise you would need the Microsoft 365 Defender endpoint protection on that device as well too to do additional discovery of these documents. But these activity logs are great to see you know what users are doing within the company, and you can see whenever a new label is applied, things like that. This is the one I just did on that document that you just saw, and you can see all the the transaction or um, high level activity that's going on on each device or in the file share things like that. You even get recommendations here as well too on what you should be doing. So you can say, oh, there's sort of 65 sensitive data types containing credit card information. Maybe you should go apply those with a confidential label, for instance. So again, I'll do a deep dive on this just so you guys have more time uh, to look at that, but it's it's very powerful service that you can get into. The basis with this though, as far as the information protection solutions, that you have here on devices, you have Windows Information Protection that we looked at. You have an Office 365, uh, the DLP service. This is not part of the plans I'm gonna cover, but the DLP services you can apply as well too. And then with Azure Information Protection, that's where you get into you know things that you can protect both on-prem, in the cloud as well too, data centers, file shares. Third-party SaaS applications can also be part of this service as well too and looking at applying labels to those documents as well too that might not be in OneDrive, but are in Dropbox, for instance. You can start to look at that. Um, additionally, you can use Cloud App Security, but that's not part 
the cloud app discovery is part of M365 BP and it's only one side of things. So I wasn't going to cover that. Um, but it gets, you know, when you get into the enterprise level plans or uh, a plan that covers this, that's when it gets more powerful as well too. So I wanted to give you guys a high level overview here of all the things you can do for data loss. You know, it's a longer video here, but I appreciate you guys uh, following and subscribing to the channel. Please like or subscribe also if you guys want to see more content around this. Please leave any comments below too. Any policies or configurations you guys are doing to configure in your environments or any questions you had about the video in general. Thanks guys. Have a great day.